Hi everyone, this is Carrick from Angry Centaur Gaming, and I'm stunned, confused, frightened, and horrified as I bring you a no-spoilers review of Pillars of Eternity by Obsidian and published by Paradox Interactive. This game was kickstarted, which just like Divinity Original Sin means that a good deal less people were screwed during the creation of this game, and in fact, the creation of this game even happening in the first place is probably completely based on the fact that fans know what they want far more than some overlord sitting in their CEO chair made of customer support letters, ordering escorts for their sordid sexual deviances, and tactically figuring out just how many types of DRM they can get into a game while squeezing every bit of fun from a title like DLC was created to suck out our own soul juices. Instead, we get a game that harkens back to the past, back when Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, the Icewind Dale series, and Torment ruled the roost for role-playing games, slapping around other titles with thick narrative, insanely long playthroughs, and tactical gameplay that sat firmly next to characterization in ways most developers would consider a puzzle, like forgotten languages before someone tripped over the Rosetta Stone. Pillars of Eternity is a role-playing game that eschews Dungeon and Dragons rule sets and worlds and jumps into the fray using its own rule set in its own world because fuck D&D. Obsidian has a track record for some stellar writing and a tight-knit history with buggy games like Tiger Woods and Ladies of the Night. So has Obsidian continued on that same track, comfortable releasing a game with great atmosphere but lacking on the technical end, or has Obsidian learned from past issues and hired some people for their testing unit? Remember, as always, this review is caffeinated, which means freakishly fast with frivolity and facts delivered into your frontal lobes. They say the eye is a beautiful palace where the imagination is stoked. So graphics are up first. You know, I do have to say it's odd going back to 2D times, and if not for Obsidian's almost perfect handling of the game world's graphical presentation, the game would have felt dated. However, with an almost uncountable number of particle effects, giblets exploding pinata-like into the air, and an insane layering of atmospheric effects that at times had me saying out loud, holy crap. The game always felt present and lodged in today's technical future. I make no bones about it. The game looks fantastic both from an art direction and it also has tangible artistic connections to both Torment and the Baldur's and Icewind Dale series. The game also harkens back to those titles when it comes to the basic interwoven interactive paintings that those games look like. With the ability to zoom in and out, High resolution texturing abounds on characters and levels alike, leaving you in awe at the attention to detail both stylistically and technically. It's truly outstanding looking from the first moments to the last. Now that doesn't mean the game is perfect overall. Zooming in can leave some of the environments looking nice but a bit blocky, even at the highest resolutions. However, that's like saying amateur porn sucks because it's four seconds of action followed by a donation bell and two people staring at the camera dumbfounded. It's still hot, and so is Pillars of Eternity. My friends, the game is insane looking, showing a technical aptitude towards artistic flow that seems lost by most developers, and comes as close to Divinity Original Sin in Relieving gamers of the worry that a game based on looking down at a group of characters has to look muddy or boring or disconnected. Frame rates were usually stellar, though placing uh, a high number of atmospheric details did seem to drop the frame rate a little bit, and when Gibbs flew into the air like it was raining men, there were times when I saw a hit, but nothing that really impacted gameplay. Truly, there's not much more to say than this is excellence in execution. Artistically, stylistically, it was just great. Sound, music, and voice. Lava will be on suit. How may I help? Sound is up first. Now listen, a 2D game like this needs to have these issues dialed in tight, or a gamer can be disconnected from the game's actions, especially when a game like this that throws enough information into your ocular orbs you wonder if the lead game designer was called Crankmatic the Thunder Shit. However, the sound design is brilliant. Ambient acoustics abound, spells flash, then bang into audio life like there's a real tangible delay between light and sound. Even the crossbows and bows, one of my pet peeves in games, is handled well with everything from hits to misses thundering across a screen. Right to left is separated correctly, and headphones or a good speaker system will delight you with excellent separation. It's just a delight when momentary pauses in sound occur as actions are cued, and then a complete goddamn cacophony of sound as weapons smash, spells explode, and animals attack. Simply brilliant audio work, except for one small issue, 
or bug. If you're fast traveling across a map and move your view away from the party, let's say towards the end where you want them to go, at these times the ambient sounds had a tendency to skip or stutter like the game was suddenly confused over where I was, where it was, where the party was, and it couldn't figure out if I really gave a shit and wanted to hear what was going to be played. It was odd, it didn't happen very often, and depending on play style, you may not even notice it. Altogether though, it was excellent sound design, aside from that one little issue. Up next is music. Justin Bell's the composer and audio director, and this boy loves himself some bells and flutes. But that's not all he loves. He loves violins, maybe a xylophone, triangles, oboes, and I swear to God, one section here has what sounds like the Tyrannosaurus Rex from Jurassic Park just jumping around in the background. It sounds discordant, but it isn't. You see, Justin also seems to understand that negative space in music can do wonders for a soundtrack at times. And here, the music almost disappears, leaving the echoes of footsteps playing in time with nothing more than perhaps one or two almost silent instruments, like someone on the team forgot they were supposed to be playing. It's fantastic. I'm not sure if it beats Divinity or Ori, which are both soundtracks that redefine what I thought I would hear during a game. Though there are some loops, they've obviously understood that it's best to keep that to a minimum, and whether by design or accident, you have a soundtrack that both reminds you it's there and playing and also disappears leaving the sound effects room to breathe seemingly at the same time I'm not gonna lie and say that some tracks didn't really sound almost copied from Icewind Dale and Baldur's Gate but at the same time wind instruments remind you of Morrowind or Oblivion as well and some tracks have an almost Jeremy soul style to them but in the end all of them sound in some way unique to this game. Now, if you can't tell by now, I think it's fabulous. It's utterly amazing. It's a great soundtrack. This is a soundtrack that I'm going to listen to both separate from and within the game without ever becoming bored of a single track. Up next is voice. Time to see and not be seen. Yes? What? By the time I realized what had happened, the district had already been sealed. So we fed when we needed, and locked ourselves in the tower to work. And then there came a time when the hunger struck. You know, voice and continued effects continuity are important skills, the kind you want to keep and pay attention to, like the settings on Hubble before launching it. It's sort of kind of important, just remember that. Firstly, this game might have more voices and one-liners and voiced content than any other game I can briefly remember. Every battle action has voice effects, most standby NPCs have at least some dialogue, and main characters are literally infected with lengthy dialogue that seems both event perfect and tonally correct. For those characters, for the most part, inflection and situational awareness are sound. However, I have to say from time to time I was disappointed to find that many times effects continuity was nowhere to be seen. Enter a cave where every voice and person who speaks appears to be impacted by being inside, you know, a giant fucking echoey place. But then when you talk to a main NPC or a bad guy, they sounded studio perfect, bright and tight, leaving you woefully unconnected to their location and the event that was going on around you. Now that could have been a design choice to make sure dialogue was clear, but I never noticed dialogue being unclear when effects were present. Overall, it only crops up in locations where you would notice it. It's a missed opportunity for sure, but I'm gonna count that as more of a personal dislike and not something that others may even notice. That being said, when you sprint into battle with a bevy of possibly mentally handicapped spellcasters, chanters, and foreign creatures bent on using your insides like a slip and slide, the voices are tremendous. The spellcaster's voices boom into a crescendo while disgusted fighters unable to hurt enemies plead with you to do better at whatever the hell you're doing at that moment. All in all, it was good with occasional fits of what the hell. Gameplay. As I said before, no spoilers. So you're a dude on a mission that's given a special power that allows you to see the souls of others, which is quickly tied into the main plot. Otherwise, the game might as well just be called Random Dude Does Stuff in a Fantasy World. Instead, you're somewhat chosen and somewhat dragged into a main plot that involves a big bad guy with severe mental issues, a land in need of fixing, and a rule set that I have to say needs to be picked up by every other rule-playing game ever made in the future. As you stun, horrify, emolate, freeze, friend zone, snipe, cut, slash, bash, break, and gibbify enemies in your own unique rendition of current day 
treaty negotiations. You also level up, take on more skills, outfit your characters with weapons both special and glowing full of enchantments, and try to stop some diabolical insane man from basically just screwing everything up. First, I have to say that seeing other people's souls is a delightful addition to this game, and uh, I feel that some people are going to love it and others will probably quickly tire from it. Some NPCs in the world can be viewed, and there's a narrative story. It's usually half a page to two pages telling you their past. I adored it, but since it's not spoken, and some can run insanely long, and doing it doesn't offer any bonuses or gameplay experience, it's an awesome but ultimately throwaway experience when it comes to those characters. It, however, does come up with enemies and the main NPCs in in spectacular ways and is pivotal to the actual story as well. So it's give and take. Now, the rule set these guys chose is basically a streamlined, typical RPG set. However, instead of having the typical stats that are throwaway, every stat does have the same effect for every class. So a fighter with high might does more damage, but a wizard's damage is also based somewhat off might as well. Now, some may say this makes no sense, but as you look at the attributes and the classes and how magic is done, it starts to dawn on you that there's a really soft interplay here between class modifiers, the skills themselves, and most importantly, the game world's design that just isn't done anywhere else. I can't tell you the last time a game world and rule set seemed this organic and easy to understand. What seems to be fairly basic as a model stretches its mathematical legs when you begin to realize that two magic users will play, respond, and deploy completely differently if you, as the player, decided to concentrate on might or resolve or intellect, as each one not only adjusts a specific attribute of your spells, but also feed into one another in ways that most role-playing systems have to add skills or talents to. However, this game also has talents, and that's where the world opens up. Though the game doesn't have the combined awesome spell effects of Divinity Original Sin, it does have an incredible amount of class synergy, where talents from one class directly benefit from another class as talents, but it's also insanely simple. It can appear basic at first, only once you begin to outfit a character and play. Do you find gems like certain party members being able to totally withstand point blank area of effect attacks by their own spellcasters to quickly kill the enemy, while playing differently would yield that need to mobilize and strategize at a higher level, but perhaps might have a harder hitting team as a whole. Possible in other games? Probably. This slickly and without the need to really minimax? Probably not. And it's this simplicity of presentation mixed with the subtlety of character, race, and attribute appreciation that can't be easily described other than this one simple thing. There doesn't seem to be any dead-end builds at all. Planning can change for a character on a whim, yet no one is impervious to possible death, so it doesn't feel like you're cheating the system. After 50 plus hours, I've yet to see something that just doesn't make sense, and that is completely odd to me in a role-playing system. Now, classes and races do run the typical gambit, with chanters replacing bards and so on, but they're actually fun this time, and other character classes and races befitting typical role-playing stereotypes, I guess you'd call it. There were really no true surprises here, though Obsidian did their best to make the expected fresh and at least interesting, and you can tell that they really wanted people to feel the flexibility offered in their rule system versus artificially holding any race or class accountable for nothing more than historical correctness or possible nerd rage. Add to this rarity the ability to not only take main NPCs, but to just walk into a bar, almost any bar, and just buy another character. Find out you don't like having the setup you have, just hire an adventurer that is level correct and update them and get to it. While this might sound like a bunch of fucking idiotic stormtroopers barreling in into bulkheads at the speed of stupid, instead it turns out to be utterly fantastic, allowing you to not only have a larger party at will, but also outfitting your stronghold and mixing and matching the main NPCs that you can gather as well as your own. You see, quickly as you're adventuring and learning of your main NPCs and main player stories, you also get a stronghold. Think Dragon Age Inquisition, but easy to navigate, with far greater tangible results from upgrades including hirelings, holding your party members that can themselves go out and do quests, and also metagames involving having attacks that you can either auto-resolve or jump into any defenders at the stronghold and play out manually. And like the last time I saw a lion carrying a trailer of M16s and Hooters girls, this is an amazing thing to experience. The stronghold is game all by itself, offering you a ton of perks and loads of interactivity that plays completely separately from the main story, but somehow, organically, melds itself to the fun you experience throughout. Now, as you adventure, you not only have the main adventure to deal with, you have a bevy of actions and mini-stories that can adjust your reputation among specific groups. Groups. These reputations, as well as your own stats, all feed into conversations, and unlike, let's say, Renegade and Paragon and Mass Effect, these various categories have deep and resounding impact on story moments. Perform speeches? Check. Inter-party involved decision-making? Check. Creative use of skills you didn't think impacted most discussions? Check. This is a game where not only inborn skills, but physical
physical traits can make impact on the story in profound ways. In my honest opinion, Obsidian's effectively rewrote the book on statistics impacting the realistic and stylistic. Unfortunately, not everything is sunshine and rainbows. While pathing is altogether fine, there are many sections within the game world where your team can easily be funneled into a death tube of infinite shittery as the location, though looking wide open, is actually a two-person side-by-side location, like your characters can't walk over a fucking ivy branch. I found myself using the thoroughly unrealistic, oh shit, run the mouse over every section to see if this location is walkable tactic, and that is just bad game design. Many locations can be unrealistically and artistically tight, while seemingly identical locations are hideously open, eliciting a feeling of disgust towards your characters as you point at your barbarian screaming, just fucking walk forward. It happened far too regularly for my likes, and I found that it artificially slowed gameplay from time to time depending on the location. Additionally, they have an insanely deep scroll writing and enchantment system. Enchantment! But like Oregon Band and Hippies, it makes no sense by unrealistically limiting enchanting to not only just your main weapons, but just the main body armor. And also forgetting to put in stops when enchanting doubles up, and you have to be ultra careful to not enchant something that basically is worse than the current enchantment. Might as well just sell your fucking eyes and train to be a sniper, it makes no sense. And there was this vague warning from time to time that reminds you that some pluses compress one another, but since many times they also don't, once you jump into the main enchantment screen, you can't see the current enchantment, so be ultra careful. Otherwise, I'm not going to lie and say it wasn't fun running around the world, Lindsay low handing it up, just stealing everything not nailed down, and then using it to enchant your fine plus two constitution slain sort of forgetfulness plus three. It's good times, but it does have a couple caveats here and there. Now, lastly, when it comes to the story itself, success and suck share the first three letters for a reason. I've always felt that a story can be a treatise to narrative, sort of dogmatic and defined by its own boundaries, but doing wonders within that or refreshingly unfair fettered by normal considerations, but running the risk of being lazy and unfinished. While both styles have the chance of being successful or sucking, pillar storytelling devices fall somewhere dynamically in the middle. Now, that's not to say it falls within the middle. The story itself doesn't. The way they tell it does. I can only assume that the developers were raised by roving packs of psychiatrists and arsonists because the game is insanely deep on intellectual stuff, dealing with adultery, betrayal, subtle forms of slavery, dark magic, insanity, and my favorite, hot cousin on cousin sex, while of course allowing you to fix all these things via killing almost everyone and lighting them on fire. Luckily, of course, there are many ways to get through the game, and I found myself rebounding between killing everyone and lighting them on fire because it's fun and subtly lined my way through situations to see the effects of both. And while both had profound effects on my party makeup and small branches throughout the story's side missions, never did I feel that there was much of a full branching path. All roads lead to El Dorado here. That's not to say it's a lackluster. In fact, I found the story incredible and for the most part well written, but it is overly linear as a full on tale. Save game replays did seem to prove that. I can't say that's a bad thing here as the developers set out to tell a specific story. So that lack of true branching for me personally is not a negative. I do have one major kudo to give, a childlike kudo that comes somewhere from my pre-puberty heart where I didn't know the world was made up of bad tidings and razor blade smiles. And that is the level design. Even with the sometimes brutal fatal funnels, it was epically awesome. Exploration was at times a treat, the likes of which reminded me of a kid getting their first bike and exploring the local neighborhood, except here the neighborhood is filled with lions, spellcasters, and shit that wants you in its belly. Fun factor. You know, the game is balls to the walls fun, from the character creation, reputation systems, and fluidity to the adult story told with a fairly even hand down to the kinetic battle systems. With its pausable, slow motion, and fast motion choices for battles, it all felt glorious, usually. However, like putting a fucking trampoline in a doghouse, there were limitations that befuddled me, like the artificially tight enchanting, the what the fuck pathing in some locations, and the odd audio choices. Regardless, those issues just did not negate the fact that this game is a plus five to fun factor, even if that plus five can't be applied to my helmet or boots. Longevity. Well, I think that with a game like this, longevity is assumed, but since I got to test some of the pathing, the various team makeups, and the stronghold metagame, I think longevity here is a moot factor. The game is easily 35 plus hours for a single playthrough, and if you did all the side quests and explored every location, I can only assume that's an additional 20 to 40 as well. Not to mention the various difficulties, which range from easy to might as well start crying now and oh god, where art thou? That change a great deal within the game's battles. These difficulties really do change the way the game feels 
controls and interacts. Longevity, I think, is through the roof. Now, lastly, bugs. I did encounter one or two bugs. One required reloading and involved the game not recognizing I had utterly beat the shit out of my enemies, so I called that the Carrick is Awesome bug. It did happen a couple times, and I sadly had to reload before that battle. Another was a quest that continued despite my fulfilling its expectations, and it just didn't say that I could move on. However, as with many quests in the game, there were three or four ways to finish that one, so I just did another one of those ways and moved on from there. So as you guys know, I rate games on a buy, wait for sale, rent, or banish the game to the land of unenchantment rating scale. This is a buy. No, this is actually a game with a digital yep and a capital now and a full uppercase buy it. Of course, if you hate role-playing games, then it doesn't offer you much in the way to make you change your mind, but then why are you still listening anyway? Guys, the game's fantastic, and any missteps, no matter how inane feeling at times, doesn't come close to the sheer obesity of awesomeness the game shows you as it throws its weight around. A possible peerless attribute and skill system, phenomenal breadth of story, easy to grasp, hard to master battle design, and unbelievable customability makes this title a must-have for gamers who like this kind of game. Full stop. So that's it for me. If you disliked the video, hit dislike. If you liked it, hit like. Maybe subscribe because every sub helps. And if you're just sitting around here wondering what the hell you're listening to, well, then I thank you for sitting through it. Remember, you can join our forums to talk in depth about the game. If you don't want to do that, post a comment and I'll try to get back to you. Peace out.